So the storm hits on Monday, the levee's break in the afternoon, the city's starting to fill with water. On Tuesday morning, where were you at personally and emotionally? Well, on Tuesday morning, we were definitely making an attempt to assess the situation. I went up in a helicopter um, and flew over the entire region. It, it was the most startling thing to see. When we got to Jefferson Parish, um, thousands of homes were already underwater because of other breaches all along the way. And um, Jefferson Parish into Orleans, and the, you could tell that the floodwaters were getting deeper and deeper because you could see some of the houses in Jefferson Parish. Uh, you could see where the water stopped maybe at two feet. But as you got into Orleans, all you saw was rooftops. And there were people on many, many rooftops all through this area. Uh, it, it, was, um, it, was, it, it was the most awful thing that I've ever witnessed. An incredible uh, level of destruction that one could hardly figure out adequate words to describe. And I saw boats already moving through the channels. Uh, we had our wildlife and fisheries agents were, were moving through these very treacherous areas because you must remember power lines were down, um, gas was bubbling up from houses that had been stripped from their moorings. And so we could see water bubbling in, in different locations. Um, it was very hot. It was August, like now, and it, it was um, it was an eerie, eerie scene to be flying over this to assess the damage, to see just how widespread the damage was. And the damage did not end. It was, it, it started out to be blocks and blocks, and then it was miles and miles and miles of homes that, uh, that were, were destroyed. It was unrelenting, that, uh, that level of devastation. I don't think that um, we, well, I know we were not prepared to see nearly 100% destruction of every building and every home. And in St. Bernard Parish, every single property was underwater, had taken on significant levels of water damage, some 10 and 12 feet high. Um, in, in Orleans, there were places with eight and 10 feet of water where you could, you could just see the rooftops of the, of the homes. So that's what you saw. You saw water and rooftops and then in, in on many uh, of these houses, you saw people on top of the roofs. And, you know, then as Wednesday came into play, uh, you know, we, we began to see more helicopter rescues. So the air became um, a kind of a treacherous place. Communications networks were down. And there, was no, there were no towers up to direct air traffic. So helicopter pilots started coming in to do rescue missions. The, uh, the Coast Guard was among those. The National Guard brought in as many helicopters as they could gather up. And they were doing miraculous rescue missions. Um, as it turned out, uh, you know, in the dome itself, about 10 or 12,000 people had spent the night of the hurricane in the dome. But by Tuesday evening and Wednesday morning, we had more like it was growing. We had more like 20,000 and 30,000 people at the end of the day had to be rescued, had to be um, evacuated from the Superdome itself. So that facility was truly um, overloaded with, with people because the roof had shorn and um, it, it was um, not a good place anymore to house anybody. But there they were, you know, as rescue teams um, were, were pulling people off their rooftops and out of their attics. In many cases, they, some were bringing them to the dome. Others were bringing them to levees. We had, we had buses being, um, um, school buses that we had sent in were picking up people off the highways, uh, any kind of high land where rescuers could figure out might make some sense. They were dropping large groups of people off, elderly with children and um, in the hot, hot sun uh, in this miserable, miserable situation. So it was a very difficult sight, I will tell you. And um, when you thought about 
the magnitude of loss and that each individual family was going to have to be dealing with this loss, it was a very emotionally difficult thing. Um, it was emotional when people saw their own homes underwater and their furniture and their photo albums and their records and everything about their lives had been ruined. It, it, it just, it's just incredible how difficult that is to accept in the United States of America in this day and time, but it happened here. Also on that day, when you were on the helicopter, you landed actually at the Superdome and spoke with some of the people there. What was that experience like as their governor to walk into the Superdome and speak to them? Well, the people who actually saw me arrive were so very grateful that I was there. Uh, there are a lot of people who were afraid for me to go in and they were worried that, you know, it'd be dangerous and all kinds of opinions were, were being cast out there. And I said, these are our people. I'm not afraid. I'm going to go in there. I have to talk to some of these people. I have to get a feeling for what is, you know, what's going on in their lives right now. Well, and it was a terrible mix of, of sorrow and fear. Um, and they were so happy to see me, I'll tell you that. Um, but people started telling me how they had put their children on a boat and they didn't have another chair, you know, another place on the boat, but they'd said, here, take my children. I need them to be rescued. And then they didn't know where the children had been dropped off because another boat came along and picked them up and they got a ride in and then they couldn't find their children. They couldn't find their families. And one man held his baby up and apparently he had been in the first group of people who had gone into the dome and he said, Governor, he said, look at my baby. She hasn't had a bath in three days. And he said, I need to get her out of here before she gets sick. And he was right, you know, you, you're, you're in a bad place when, when you have an infant with you. So, um, you know, I talked to them, we gave them water, we, you know, we, we tried to, to give them some assurances that help was truly gonna, gonna be there shortly. Unfortunately, it would be another uh, two days before the FEMA buses would arrive in significant numbers so that we could uh, have a, a rational evacuation and get them into safer places so where they could settle in and, and just um, uh, take care of some basic needs that their families absolutely had to have. Your former communications director, Bob Mann, told us he wanted to put some reporters on that helicopter with you, but you shot down that suggestion right away. Why was that? Well, I was, uh, I was concerned that, um, that we, well, the reporters were wanting to be on boats and, and planes and everything, uh, and I know they wanted to tell the story, but we had people who had to make clear decisions and understand what, what was going on. And we flew into the city of New Orleans and we had a meeting with Mayor Nagan and the FEMA representatives who were there. And we, uh, you, you know, we had a, a, a pretty heavy load of people already. We just really didn't have room for them. And the helicopters that we, we had, the other helicopters we had, were actually being used for rescue missions. And I just couldn't, I just didn't feel right about, you know, photographers being on a, a rescue helicopter taking the place of one person who needed to be rescued, you know, who needed to be um, taken to a safer place. And so it was, um, it was probably not the best decision because then the national media started making up stories uh, based on what they could see right where they were and not realizing the impact of, of our initiatives and, and the things that we were doing as well. But having said all that, you know, it was about saving lives more than telling stories. It was really about us getting as many people to safety as we possibly could. So f from the, the reality of it, it was the better decision. From the public relations side of it, it, it could have been better. It might have been better if we'd had a few camera, camera people on board. 